The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. If, with the exception of a few obvious outliers, the world agrees in the fundamental dignity, freedom, and justice of all people, why is securing those rights still so elusive? Tonight, we'll consider that and ask, has the international human rights movement lost its way? Then, historian Afua Cooper on how Toronto welcomed freedom seekers from the Underground Railroad almost two centuries ago. It's Thursday, February 16th, and that's next on The Agenda. In the aftermath of the Second World War and the atrocities of that brutal assault on humanity, the nations of the world reached a new agreement, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It set out in its first article that, quote, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. That document turns 75 years old in 2023. Has that declaration lived up to expectations? And is the movement that sought to ensure those human rights still relevant? Let's ask, in Silver Spring, Maryland, Seth Kaplan, professorial lecturer in the Paul H. Nitze School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. In New Haven, Connecticut, Samuel Moyne, professor of law and history at Yale University and the author of Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World. And here in our studio, Farida Deef, Canada Director for Human Rights Watch, and Sandra Wisner, an international human rights lawyer and director of the International Human Rights Program at the U of T's Faculty of Law. And we are delighted to have you two here in our studio. Samuel and Seth, great to have you on the program too in Points Beyond. I just want to start with a very open-ended question. Seth Kaplan, get us started. Has the modern human rights movement proved to be ultimately ineffective? What's your view? I would say yes. Uh, human rights had an enormous impact um, in the years after World War II, look at decolonization, look at the delegitimacy of the Soviet Union. It eventually fell. Look at South Africa. But in recent years, the human rights movement has become uh, too, too Western, too top-down, uh, too ambitious, tried to do too much, and lost its focus, and is increasingly irrelevant and ineffective in most parts of the world. Farida, what say you? Well, I mean, the goal of the human rights movement is to expose human rights abuses around the world, to amplify the voices of victims of those abuses, and to make it more costly for governments to behave in a repressive manner. And so that's what we're doing, essentially every day, increasing the cost, the political cost of repression. Sandra. You know, I think, I think that we all sort of have a different definition of what the human rights movement is when it began. And I think it's probably more important that we reframe the question and to say, what can a system of law realistically hope to achieve? And we know that no legal system is better than the society within which it serves. And, you know, the, the more cohesive that society, the stronger the legal framework. But law alone is not going to you know, bring about that change, although it is an indispensable tool for change, but it really does need to come alongside you know, societal attitude and, and changes. We'll pursue that more in a bit. Samuel, how about you on that original question of whether the international human rights movement has ultimately proved to be ineffective? I think it succeeded spectacularly in one respect. It, has stigmatized bad actors and it allows a vast number of people around the world to look down on those who are transgressing really fundamental norms. The trouble is it hasn't really succeeded in changing behavior very much. But then there's another problem, which is the goals it set for itself have been too limited. The human rights movement hasn't been a peace movement or a socialist movement, and yet we know our world is riven by war and inequality, and we need to think about those much broader uh, problems alongside the narrower concerns that human rights movements have taken up. Farida, if it has had triumphs, point to one. What would you say would be a great example of a successful instance of human rights advances? Well, there's been a number, but just to point to 
you know, a number of war criminals have been brought to justice. They've evaded justice for years. The International Criminal Court is actively pursuing them. And so in that sense, it is, it is creating a deterrent effect. Are autocrats still being repressive? Absolutely. But have, are the stakes higher now? Are they, you know, essentially looking, you know, kind of concerned about where they travel? May they be, you know, they might be pursued through prosecution. Are they worried that they might end up in the International Criminal Court? Yes. So I think that there have been instances where we see over the, the course of the past few years a number of advancements in terms of justice for victims of human rights abuses. Sandra, what's on the top of your list? I mean, I think one thing that I think is important is that this Universal Declaration of Human Rights that you mentioned, I think it's had a lot of successes in terms of inspiring other domestic states to incorporate those rights into their legislation here in Canada. Our Bill of Rights, uh, you can see that it was a clear attempt on the Diefenbaker government's part to incorporate the right, those rights into our Bill of Rights. And then you see with our charter uh, that succeeded it, that it was a clear attempt by the government to incorporate the rights of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that we had signed on to in 1976. And so I think that that's inspired a lot of different movements around the world um, that, that's been very useful. Seth, your concerns notwithstanding, is there anything at the top of your list that you would point to and say, that's an unambiguous victory? I mean, the unambiguous victories were those that happened in the past. I mentioned the Soviet Union, the fall of the Soviet Union, human rights played a major role. I mentioned South Africa. I mentioned decolonization, which is uh, an outgrowth of these rights. Uh, but I would say today, look at Syria. Look at if I'm a Uyghur in China, if I'm a, a, a Syrian who has been bombed or jailed or uh, brutally killed by my regime, or if I'm in Africa or uh, some other country and, and simply the police not a systematic effort, but the police on a daily basis violate my rights. What is human rights doing for those people? And those people are in the billions. We're talking a quarter, a third, a half of humanity uh, knows nothing about these rights and are not being helped by these rights. Samuel, those are pretty profound questions. How would you answer them? I think human rights uh, movements have done well when they've done well in targeting relatively weaker actors like African despots and warlords. But uh, George W. Bush and Vladimir Putin, uh, who helm great powers and have done far more damage to the world, have been let off the hook. I agree completely that the greatest successes are in relatively more democratic countries that decide to have human rights as part of their domestic law. And then human rights can become about citizens' movements challenging their states from within, and their successes can be extraordinary. Let's pick up on some of those names. Farida, do you imagine for a moment that Vladimir Putin worries about what the international human rights movement thinks about what he's doing? I think he does. I he mean, does. I think when you see the targeted sanctions that have been put in place where Canada, in addition to other countries, have imposed widespread asset freezes on a number of high-level Russian officials, um, they can't really travel freely anymore, their assets are frozen, there's certainly, you know, it, it's not unfathomable to imagine a situation where President Putin would find himself in the International Criminal Court. And so we've seen, with, you, with respect to Ukraine, there has has been that, you know, all of the tools in the toolbox have been used, right? We talk about targeted sanctions, an international criminal court uh, referral, um, you know, resettlement for Ukrainian ref refugees. So it's really, despite the abuses on the ground, there is more of a spotlight on the human rights situation in Ukraine and the perpetrators than ever before. And so that, I think, is a win. And, you know, Seth mentioned Syria, for example. Yes, are we seeing that, you know, 11 years into the war, uh, abuses remain? Absolutely. But at the same time, you've seen a number of wins, even over the past year, where a court in Germany, for the very first time, actually in a landmark victory, tried a Syrian official for widespread torture. This was using the international human rights movement, um, you know, a mechanism called universal jurisdiction, which means that any, any country, even if the abuses didn't take place in that country, even if the victims are not from that country, can pursue justice for the 
the most serious international crimes. And that's what German courts are doing, Syri the um, Swedish courts are doing, in order to pursue justice where it's been closed off. Well, let me follow up with Seth on that. Do you think Bashar al-Assad or Xi Jinping worry about the international human rights movement when they are doing the horrors that they are doing? I mean, what they will do, because today there are so many rights that are talked about, they will come up and say that we're, um, we're helping our societies develop economically. This is especially the Chinese case. We're offering social services to our people. And so they can look at the long list of rights that are promoted today, and they can say, we're doing a lot of these, and actually you, you democratic countries in the West, you're not, you have people who have homeless, you have people who are poor. So when we make rights about everything, these authoritarian regimes can turn around and say they're doing a better job than we are. We're forgetting the history of these successes. The history of these successes uh, were achieved because they focused on a small number of rights, uh, religious and freedom, conscious freedom, to think as you want, to say what you want, due process. Uh, rule of law, when we forget the basic rights that, that won these battles and we focus on everything, the authoritarian regimes not only are not scared, but they turn around and use rights against us. Sandra, what do you think of that characterization? Yeah, I mean, I think what he's saying there is just that perhaps you're diluting rights by by expanding them or you're picking and choosing. But I think I think if you look at what happens in the international system, you know, it tends to be that rights are reflected from the international society and reflect what is of concern to the international society. And so, you know, that this is a consensual system. I think we have to remember that this is a system of law. It's sort of a rule of law framework whereby states are can choose how to protect, you know, individuals and their human rights. And individuals have access to institutions and mechanisms whereby they can protect their rights if their national system fails to. So, you know, I think there we have to work within the confines of that consensual system. And I think that's important. Well, okay. Seth, let me get a little more explicit about this then. Uh, no, forgive me. I'm going to go to Samuel on this. Samuel, we understand that the right not to be tortured, everybody can agree on that. The right to a fair trial, everybody can agree on that. We are now hearing calls for things like internet access or free university labeled as basic imperatives of human rights. Does expanding the definition of what constitutes a human right, in your view, that way dilute the term? I don't think so. Human rights are just a way of expressing what we take to be our ethical priorities right now and to push politically. And it's not true that expanding the list of what we care about makes it harder to get things. It would be absurd if I sat in Canada and said, the government has allowed me to speak freely so it doesn't need to provide me health care. And that's going to be true on the global level as well. It's hard to get any rights. Uh, you said that everyone agrees about uh, the right to be free from torture uh, and unfair trials, but that's false. Uh, uh, and actually, we have to work not just for all kinds of human rights, including new ones if we need them, but a lot of other ends beyond what the human rights movement has proposed so far. Seth, your take on this issue of the expansion of the notion of what constitutes a basic human right? I think we. I, I think uh, those goals are admirable, but we need to differentiate between goals that are a product of policy or politics that we believe are important and human rights. If everything is a human right, if I have a list of 100 human rights, China can mark off 95 of them and it can lock up a million people and, uh, and uh, say they're doing great because we're not doing good on... Uh, uh, several of these social issues. I think the social issues are very important, but we need to differentiate between what is uh, what is most important in terms of a few rights that we can join together, which everyone across cultures, across political divides can agree are important. So there's a global consensus on what we really should focus on, and that is the only way we're ever going to hold China, Russia, Syria, et cetera, accountable for how they treat their people. 
Farida, can I get you to weigh in on that? Sure. I mean, the global consensus is the 30 articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right? And those are everything from the right to life, the right to a fair trial, to the right to food, the right to basic housing, the right to employment, the right to education. There's no way for us to determine that certain rights are more important than others. Really? Because depending, there's no hierarchy on that? Well, there's no hierarchy, just because it, it depends on your where you where you live, who you are. Right? And so those are these rights are fundamental basic rights that are should be taken as a whole. And when you think about sort of newer rights, you mentioned the internet, for mm -hmm. example. You've seen a number of countries lately, India, Myanmar, um, Bangladesh, during times of tension, crisis, election, armed conflict, decide to arbitrarily shut down the internet. No, I get it, but I wouldn't yeah. assume that the right to internet access would be taken with the same level of seriousness as the right to not be tortured. No, it's not the right to internet access. It's the right to information. It's the right, because those that information is also critical for health and for safety, right? Those, are, those rights are interconnected. So we saw what happened during internet shutdowns during a pandemic. People couldn't access in India vital information that was important for them to protect their families and themselves. And that was essentially a right to life issue, a right to health issue. Seth, you want to come back on that? Yes, actually, if you study the Universal Declaration, there is a hierarchy built into it. There's a small number of rights that are very tightly written so that there's no scope for uh, changing or interpretation across boundaries. And then there's a second tier of rights, the ones that she's referring to, that are, that are universal, but there's much more scope for interpretation by country. So, for example, the ones that there's no scope, they're very tightly written, and they're meant to be a higher priority are protections against genocide, slavery, torture, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment, deportation or forcible transfer of population, discrimination, and protection for freedom of conscience and religion. They built a hierarchy into the most important human rights document. And if I also refer back to something that came up before, the Universal Declaration is not a legal document. Human rights are not going to be promoted with legal mechanisms. They're only going to be promoted on the moral authority of the case that is being made across cultures, across political dispositions, across the North, South, East, West, only when we focus on things that are so essential that no one can disagree with them can we build a global consensus that can actually make a real difference. I should get Sandra to weigh in on that as well. Do you think that this, I don't know, are, are we diluting the notion of what constitutes a human right when we say internet access and freedom from torture are essentially equally important? I mean, I think there's a, we have built into the system of international human rights a differentiation. That's why we have sort of customary international law, which is whereby, you know, we we have states who are acting in a certain way, who are giving opinio juris, and, and they're indicating to us that these rights are extremely important. And I also think that, you know, I th if we listen to the international community, they are telling us what rights are important to them. And I think that that sort of lends itself into treaties, into the treaty process. So for instance, when the UN uh, Human Rights Council brought forth that resolution recognizing the right to a healthy and safe, clean environment only two years ago now, that was after you had sort of 80% of UN member states who had actually signed on to that and prescribed to that right themselves domestically. And so that was a natural progression. And you can, I mean, it's obvious that we care about that right now. Um, perhaps, you know, it, it, it is incremental change and that's another topic, but um, you see that and that's now why we have last year, the UN General Assembly also passing a res resolution acknowledging the right to a healthy environment. Okay. Let me go off on a different tack here. Samuel, I'll bring you in on this. Would you call the international human rights movement a movement that promotes world peace? It's, it, it, it isn't. Uh, it's, it actually arose and became prominent on the ruins of peace, of peace movements that were once much more uh, commonsensical to a lot of people, uh, and for very good reason. Uh, Actually, in our time, especially in the 1990s, human rights movements occasionally argued for war, in particular for humanitarian intervention to save civilians. And what we can reflect is that our ancestors understood the importance of constraining great powers, those 
uh, like my country and Russia uh, and even middle powers like yours when they go to war because human rights are most at stake when states cross their borders militarily. And I think it's it's tragic that human rights have monopolized the space of what we think will make the world a better place and lost other movements like peace movements and socialist movements that were actually much more popular uh, in their time than human rights movements have been in ours. Farida, let me give uh, you a chance to weigh in on that. And in doing so, set it up by saying, you know, it, during the Obama administration, there were significant efforts undertaken by peaceable people who cared a lot about human rights to strike militarily in Syria and in Libya. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, does the international human rights movement, is it a peace movement in your view? It's not a peace movement. Essentially, I mean, we, we, you know, most human rights organizations don't take a position one way or the other in terms of armed conflict, in terms of issues of, of state sovereignty, about whether or not a country should go to war or not. What we're concerned about is how, you know, the, the types, the way in which wars are waged, the types of abuses that are happening. Are, you know, countries using uh, landmines, which are prohibited weapons? Are they using chemical weapons? Are they targeting civilian areas, um, you know, unlawfully and arbitrarily? You know, so those, the, the way in which countries wage war is what we're concerned about. Gotcha. Okay, Seth, over to you now. You've written that human rights movements are overwhelmingly led by Western countries that regularly denounce countries in the global south for their perceived abuses. Do you think that's problematic? Uh, yes, I would say Western countries, Western money, uh, Western-based organizations, I think it's, uh, it's unfortunate. It means that human rights has become very monocultural. It reflects the views of a relatively small number of people. Um, the human rights field is not accountable and it's not reflective of many cultures and views, and that's why it has lost its universalness. And as, if you go back to the things I said before, if you stick to the basics, you can build a universal consensus across cultures and, and different political views. If you reflect the views of people from one culture and one, or one set of people within those cultures, you are very likely to uh, produce rights and produce arguments that have very little bearing on people's lives. And I would just say, in general, there's a condescending uh, attitude too often in the human rights field. I mean, I can speak from uh, talking with Africans and um, people in the Middle East. Uh, they may agree with many of the ideas. They just don't like the way they're talked to. They don't like the lack of appreciation for their religion, for their communities, uh, for their countries. And it, it causes problems that should not be part of the human rights field. Sandra, what about that? Too Western, too narrow in its base? There's definitely challenges, of course. Um, and that's based upon the fact that this is, again, a, a, a framework that is based upon political will of different parties, of different states, um, who can choose to, to do what they wish. Um, but, you know, I think it's important to remember, although laws are, you know, made by states, they're heavily influenced indirectly by other actors. It was more than a century ago that NGOs were participating in negotiating a treaty. And there are mechanisms by which, uh, you know, marginalized countries can come together to enforce their rights. I know there's talk of right now um, some of the Pacific Islands thinking about bringing the climate justice issue in front of the, inter, uh, the International Court of Justice in the form of an advisory opinion, but nonetheless to discuss sort of what are states' responsibilities responsibilities when it comes to climate justice, because we know that marginalized states are taking the brunt of it and weren't responsible. Um, so I do think there are some successes. I mean, you can go back to um, the Universal Declaration that we've been talking about to see that there was there was a fight there from um, uh, in a movement, I think Brazil and India sort of led it, where they wanted those rights to be universal. And, and they were successful in that. And that was, you know, at the dismay of the United States in the United Kingdom, who didn't want women's rights to be incorporated. Samuel, your view on this? Too narrow, too Western a base? What do you think? I, I think it's certainly true that the lion's share of funding for human rights activism not only comes from 
the West, but really one person um, uh, yeah. in the West, George Soros. George but Soros. Uh, beyond that, I think it would be a mistake to claim that uh, there's been a, a decline in kind of global participation. Remember, there were only 50 odd states that existed at the time of the Universal Declaration. Now there are close to 200. And in fairness, the human rights movement uh, though funded out of the West, has become much more participatory uh, in, in, in including lots of global Southern activists. What's essential, though, is that as soon as you begin consulting global actors, you have to change your priorities beyond Western ones, focus narrowly on free speech and other civil liberties. And that's because global actors are concerned about war and peace in ways that human rights movements are not. And they're concerned about fair distribution in the unequal world that almost requires most funding to come uh, out of the West for human rights and any other reformist cause. I guess, Frida, I should ask you whether you see anything particularly wrong or unjust about the fact that much of the momentum in your movement comes from the Western world. If the West is you know, prepared to put the money and resources into this fight. Is there anything particularly wrong with that? I mean, I don't think that much of the, the momentum comes from the West. In fact, it could be that big international human rights organizations, certainly like my own, have a very large megaphone. But that doesn't mean that the women's rights movement, uh, the labor rights movements aren't active, um, actually more active in non-Western countries um, to some degree than actually in the West. So when you think about all the rollbacks that are happening on reproductive rights in the United States, at the very same time that that was happening, you saw the women's rights movement in South America, in Mexico, and Colombia actually push forward and increase, um, you know, reproductive rights and, and health rights. And so those are, there's ways in which even migrant, when you think about domestic workers who are among the most exploited workers in the world, it was the result of labor rights movements, of migrant rights groups in Asia that pushed for better protections um, and an international labor organization treaty on this. And so when you think about it, it's not, there are very, very active movements across the world. It just might be that we're not hearing from them. They don't have a large megaphone, but they're actively working in this space. And they've actually resulted, even when you think about the former Liberian um, president, Charles Taylor, he was an exile in, in Nigeria for years, evading justice, evading the reach of the International Criminal Court. And it was African human rights activists who actually pushed the Nigerian government to actually you know, send him to The Hague for, uh, for trial. And so really, I think we, we disparage these groups and the movement if we look at only a few kind of organizations that are active in the space, when in fact, you have a very active movement across issues from disability rights to migrant rights to LGBTQ rights that are active across the world. In which case, Sandra, how optimistic or not are you about the future of the international human rights movement? <laughs> I mean, I think there's a lot of changes sort of going off of what Frida said. Um, I think there's, you know, I was trained in movement lawyering, and that's something that is sort of new to the NGO field, and, and it really is meant to sort of listen to grassroots movements, uh, you know, and, and just sort of be a part of them and have those lecture, uh, legal victories be guided by that activism. So I think there's lots of hope there. I think personally for Canada, there's lots of exciting things happening. Um, I think the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous people that the UN uh, recognized in 2007, um, Canada didn't, but um, Canada has since decided that and, and explained to the UN that it will incorporate and conform its statute book to the de to the declaration. And so I think that's that's something to to look forward to and to see if the political will will be there to to make that happen. Samuel, do you think that the public is too impatient in its hope for in its hope for evidence of more victories for the international human rights movement? I actually think the human rights uh, public is is shifting away because it's impatient with how narrowly um, human rights uh, organizations have set out uh, to change the world. Young people today now see that, as Farida said earlier, 
human rights movements only signed up to humanize war rather than keep it from happening. And they certainly have never been socialist movements, whereas young people are adopting more ambitious causes uh, to sit alongside human rights movements in order to restore them to their proper place, which is narrow and small. Seth, what's your view on this notion that uh, young people today aren't going into the international human rights movement in a way they may have in the past because they just don't necessarily see it as the best vehicle for progress. I, if we look globally, and going back to your earlier question, I mean, I'm optimistic because rights as an idea is out there in the world, that young people in different parts of the world are going to be engaged with human rights and are going to work to promote them within their countries. In terms of the West and what we see in front of us, I think Sam, Sam is right that uh, human rights is not so attractive. I think it's lost its credibility. It's lost its importance. I think I would disagree with the cause. And again, I think the human rights movement or the industry that's human rights, if it wants to be relevant, it has to be relevant in challenging authoritarian regimes that treat their people awfully. And we have to be asking ourselves what is needed to challenge China, what is needed to challenge Syria and other countries like that. Farida, that sounds like a real shot across the bow there. You've lost your credibility and importance. What I mean, say you? I, I think the human rights, I think human rights in general are more important now than ever before as a lens to look at all kinds of existential crises that we have in the world today. And it's not the responsibility of the human rights movement to end all human rights abuses in the world. Certainly, first and foremost, it's up to governments. Governments are the ones tasked with guaranteeing the human rights of their people. But you've got right? to light the fuse. But we have to light the fuse. We're, we're ensuring that uh, we're stiffening their spines, hmm. right? That's our role is to put pressure on them, expose abuses, expose inaction, and push them and you know to raise the costs of inaction and raise the cost of repression. That's the role of the human rights movement, and I see it more important today than ever before. But also, I see wins here. I see uh, repressive autocrats more isolated than ever before. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia has to think twice about where he travels in the world. Um, President Putin will do the same. Just because of the reach of justice and the pressure that's being put on actors, on countries and, and their allies to pursue justice in these cases. Samuel, do you see enough spine stiffening happening courtesy of the human rights movement? I think there's a lot. And I think, you know, as I see it, human rights movements have an essential role to play, but they also need to recognize uh, that uh, there's not just their causes, but social and global justice generally that's at stake. And they do have a responsibility to be clear about what goals they're advancing and where others are needed. Uh, and human rights movements may need to have stiff spines, but step aside for others' movements with even stiffer spines and more ambitious goals. Hmm. Sandra, what do you think of that advice? I mean, I just think it's interesting because um, a lot is being put on the sort of civil society movement, and I, I find that really interesting. I think that there is responsibilities there when you take on that type of role. Um, and, and there's lots of challenges and lots to be done, especially with focusing more on economic social rights, which I agree with. Um, but this is really, this is up to all of us. This isn't just up to whatever this human rights movement is, but it, you know, it's up to all actors. This is an international society and we're all a part of it, that fabric. And um, I just think that we need to zoom out a little bit and try to work with everyone on, on these problems. Is your megaphone today as big as it once was? <laughs> sure. <laughs> you think yes? I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, I think that, I don't know. I, think, I, think, I still think it's important. Seth, why don't you take that on in our last minute here? Does this movement speak with as big a megaphone as it once did? Depends on the audience. It's not very uh, loud in the places where it's most needed, but it's certainly loud in our countries. And uh, I, I would just say it's not reaching the people it needs to reach, and it needs to reconsider how it can amplify its voice and amplify its message to make a greater difference in the world today.
Well, I want to thank the four of you for coming on to TVO tonight and amplifying the message and having the conversation here on the agenda. So let me thank in our studios out of town, Samuel Moyne, the professor of law and history at Yale University, Seth Kaplan, prof professorial lecturer at Johns Hopkins University, and here in our studio in Toronto, Farida Deef, Canada Director for Human Rights Watch, and Sandra Wisner, International Human Rights Program Director at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Law. Great to have the four of you on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. While Canadians, and particularly Ontarians, are rightly proud of being a destination for those people who escaped slavery in the United States, there are plenty of gaps in the public's knowledge about the Underground Railroad. For instance, that Toronto was an important hub and that those who came here made substantial contributions to the city. Historian Afua Cooper is the Killam Research Chair at Dalhousie University and co-author of The Underground Railroad. Next stop, Toronto. And she joins us now from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Afua, it's great to see you again. How are you doing? Likewise, Steve. Thank you. I'm good. I'm good. Not at all. Uh, let's start from uh, from really first principles here, because I don't want to assume anybody or everybody knows everything about this. The Underground Railroad refers to a system of secret routes and safe houses which enslaved fugitives made their way to freedom from the United States. How did it get its name? It got its name... Um after 1793, when um, enslaved Africans would run away from different parts of the United States, mainly from the north, uh, from the south to the north, and one slaveholder said, "Oh my goodness, it's as if they they escaped underground because they couldn't find them." So this whole idea of the underground railroad um, enslaved people running away to freedom—that's um, where it's got its um, its linguistic beginning. And let's go back even before that. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, what did that say? The Fugitive Slave Act basically said, um, or it empowered slaveholders and citizens at large, white citizens, to track down and run away uh, and, and track down and, um, you know, capture people who they deemed were runaway slaves. So it really was um, a frightening piece of legislation for enslaved people who had escaped from the South, were living in the North, or even free Black people, because many free Black people were captured, because the federal government now said, we're empowering mar federal marshals and citizens at large to capture you and return you back to slavery. So that caused a huge panic in the Black community in Northern cities and, and villages and towns. So then people said, you know what, we're going to just head straight to um, to the Canadian border and cross over into Canada, into British territory. So is it fair to say that that act had a significant role to play in the creation of the Underground Railroad? Well, it, it certainly expanded it. It enlarged it. It made it a more... Uh, vital. It, it breathed life into it. The Underground Railroad was actually quite active, quite animated. But yes, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 really animated it even more. When you look at the um, the literature, they said the border points at Windsor and at the, in the Niagara area were just um, uh, bursting with people. People, children, men and women were just crossing. Hundreds were crossing daily after that piece of legislation was passed in November 1850. And so it, it really expanded and augmented the Black population in the cities and towns uh, along the border and, and, and also across the lakes. Toronto is across the lake. Um, Kingston is across the lake, so or the St. Lawrence River. And so the, the population in these places got, got really um, larger. Now, as you say, Afua, that was 1850. Let me take you to the following year, 1851. And you note in your book that one of the most important anti-slavery events took place in Toronto in 1851. Tell us about that. Well, yes, the, in September 1851, Henry Bibb, who was an abolitionist and a, a co-founder of the Anti-Slavery Society and the publisher of the first black newspaper in Canada, The Voice of the Fugitive, 
called this convention at St. Lawrence Hall because it's 1851, hundreds of people, thousands of people are coming, have crossed border points. And so the security and the safety of Black people was uppermost in the minds of everyone, especially the leaders. So this convention was called at St. Lawrence Hall to discuss the safety and security of Black people within Canada and also within the United States. Henry Bibb and the delegates concluded that the best place for Blacks in North America, fugitive slaves should run away to, to Canada. That was um, one of the recommendations. But the best place was the Canadian colonies and urged people to come to Canada. Um, not only fugitive slaves, but also free people. Remember I said previously that free Black people were also kidnapped by federal marshals. If you saw the film 12 Years a Slave, you get an idea of what I'm saying. Um, kidnapped by federal marshals and taken into slavery. So Toronto was above with um, dozens of delegates from all over Canada, the United States. There were um, delegates from the West Indies and the British Isles too that came to discuss the safety and security of Black people in, in Canada. And um, Toronto was also a major destination for freedom seekers. So, you know, we know that by 18... Um, by the mid 1850s, over a thousand black people were living in Canada, in Toronto. And what made Toronto such a, a, a good spot uh, as a terminus on the Underground Railroad? Toronto was across the lake. You could, it was easily, you could put people on ferries, cross from Rochester. So Toronto was a major, it was a maritime destination on the Underground Railroad. You can cross the lake, you can come around from the Golden Horseshoe. Um, it was uh, relatively safe and secure by time, you know, if, if slave catchers are attempting to capture people in Toronto by, it, it wasn't so easy for them to, to escape. So it was at a um, Location-wise, it was uh, relatively a safe place to be, and the community was very mobilized. The Black community was very mobilized, and the white community, the white allies, the white abolitionists were also very mobilized and very organized. So Toronto, in many ways, was really a special place. Now, the Toronto, of course, of uh, 170 years ago uh, is not the Toronto of today. Uh, it was a very, very small city. It was, uh, frankly didn't go much much north of uh, college street back then right. but the question is did did most black settlers at the time settle in the inner city or did they go to the outskirts most black settlers were in the inner city but of course the outskirts were happening the liberties um this were the liberties so if you think of Bloor and bathurst that area was called was one of the liberties or you know, today we would say the suburbs. Can you imagine a farm at uh, Blur and Bathurst? Think of that. But there were farms there at the time. So you had many uh, black settlers settling in the outskirts in the Don, um, the Don Valley area. Uh, it was called the Township of York. So you had the city of York and then the township of York, which was um, where the outskirt uh, suburbs would be. But by and large, most people settled in the core. There, there was strength in numbers. In the core, especially along um, King Street East, east from Young Street, um, you had the black businesses. Uh, it was it's tremendous when you think of the type of black businesses that were there, restaurants, hotels, barber shops, rest, um, ice cream parlors, dress shops. It was quite tremendous. It was the heart of the black business community and people lived around um, those businesses in the city. Give us some added insight, if you would, into what the difficulties would have been for b black people then to set up their own businesses in this new home of theirs in Toronto, or or others, for example, in uh, farming or trying to get jobs, etc. Yes, absolutely. Many of the freedom seekers who came, for example, the Carey brothers, they came from Virginia, 
and um, they set up uh, barber barber shops, um, ice houses, which were like uh, you know restaurants, snack shops, ice cream parlors. But they came with resources. They came with financial resources. Back in Virginia, they were established, and when they came, they were not um, fugitives from slavery. Oh, they were freedom seekers in one sense, um, because life and liberty and their security as free people were, were compromised in the United States. So they came over to Toronto, but they came with resources. Um, then you have someone like Anne Maria Jackson, who was a washerwoman who came and lived in St. John's Ward with her seven children, didn't have the kind of resources that the financial resources that the Kerry brothers had. So she used the skills that she um, had deployed in slavery, the skills of a washerwoman. And she set herself up as a washerwoman. Poor, lived in a, a frame house on Elizabeth Street. Her husband had died, took care of her children. Uh, within the farms, uh, what you had in the farming areas was that uh, members of the Black community, those who wanted a rural life, those who were farmers before, came together. So when you think of the Refugee Home Society in Essex County, or the Elgin settlement, the, you know, in around Chatham, Buxton settlement, the Wilberforce settlement around London, Ontario. People banded together, people pooled their resources, and people collectively bought land so they could establish themselves as farmers. So there were several um, avenues that people took in order to establish themselves. But, you know, Steve, after 1850, I would say 1850 to 1855, when you had the rush of people crossing the border, it was very difficult because many people came really with just the clothes on their backs and they had to be assisted. They had to find work. Um, they had to be given food. So those first five years were really emergency years. And but within the community, you had black and white abolitionists working together, and they created organization. They created mutual aid societies. They created, um, for example, in St. Catharines, Harriet Tubman was one of the co-founders of the Fugitive Aid Society. And so people pooled their resources. That was the wonderful thing, how people networked and worked together for the, the elevation and the benefit of those who were crossing the borders and seeking to establish themselves in their new home. Now, of course, the American Civil War didn't start till 1860, so we're still in the 1850s as we have yeah. this conversation. At, at, at what time did the Underground Railroad really have its largest numbers crossing the border to Toronto? Those 10 years, 1850 to 1860. Before the war. That was, yes, yeah, pre-Civil War, just before the, the yeah, we had the the largest amount of people um, crossed during those 10 years and established themselves okay. during those 10 years. 1850 was really a crucial year. Understood. Let's do an excerpt from the book here, shall we? Sheldon, I'm at the bottom of page three. Here's an excerpt from the Underground Railroad, Next Stop Toronto. Toronto, you write, was unique in 19th century Canada in that the public schools and schools of higher learning were always open to black students. In most parts of the province, black immigrants to Canada were forced to found and support private schools because local officials barred children of color from the public schools. Parents sent petition after petition to government officials demanding that schooling be made available, often with little result. I guess I want to know, fool, why you think Toronto was sort of so far ahead of the curve on this issue compared to the rest of Ontario or Upper Steve, Canada, as Steve, I guess it, it would have been called. Yeah, it's hard to say. I, you know, in Chatham, in, in Windsor Sandwich, you had an educated segment of the black community. What I mean, people like the Carey brothers, um, the Bibbs and so on. Who So you found that layer of the black community everywhere, in every city, in every town, in every village. So to say that because Toronto had a large body of educated black people, I don't think the answer, the answer would 
be that. Maybe partially a uh, part of the answer could be found in that. Um, I'm still trying to figure out why that was so. It could be also because the the leaders of the city of Toronto, people like the the various mayors, um, the pastors, pe the white people in the anti slavery society, many of the power brokers had a quote unquote enlightened mind. So we did not have segregated schooling in Toronto, and that's um, that's still something. Uh, we we're discussing and, and talking about because I'm not sure why the 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 kind of racism that you had in places like Chatham and in Windsor Sandwich London Ontario you didn't have it to the same degree in Toronto so that made Toronto really special and and unique so black children could go to school could get an education without um without the difficulties that they endured in other parts of the province. Let me follow up on that and ask this. Do you think Toronto is still ahead of the curve when it comes to black history and education? Absolutely. Toronto has always been a leader. And again, I can't say it because it had the, the largest black population. When you look at Chatham, there were over 2,000 black people in Chatham. I... Um, uh, maybe just a more enlightened set of people came to Toronto, hard to say, you know, saying that on TV, some people may take issue with that. Or the power brokers in Toronto were, um, uh, were, were more enlightened. It is, it's interesting and it's something we may never get the answer to, but it's, it's something worth pondering. I want to show you a picture of a beautiful stamp that Canada Post issued just a few days ago. This is Chloe Cooley, and this stamp honors her. And I wonder what the significant, look how beautiful that looks. And she looks so yeah. strong as she looks yeah. off onto the horizon. What is her significance to the story of black history in Canada? It, uh, her, um, Chloe Cooley is just one of my favorite people. I remember in 2007, when I coordinated for the province of Ontario, the, the bicentenary um, commemorations. And Chloe Cooley was one of the people that I recommended that the Ontario Heritage Trust plaque. So she was plaque after um, 2007, her plaque is on the Niagara Parkway, right at the spot where she was, um, taken in that boat, rowed across the river from Ontario into New York State and sold to slaveholders into New York State. Hugely significant, this woman, because her story of, you know, being sold by her slaveholder into the United States and the resistance that she made, we're told that she screamed violently and made resistance as Adam Vrooman, her enslaver, tied her up and threw, threw her in the boat. And the story was taken to Governor Simcoe. At that time, the capital of Ontario was Newark, which is um, in the Niagara area. And Simcoe vowed to end slavery in Canada, or Upper Canada. He was not successful in ending slavery, but he was successful in um, passing the act that limited slavery, that is by banning the further importation of enslaved people into the province. So July 1793, the act was passed in the Upper Canadian Parliament that limited, or I should say banned, the new importations of enslaved Africans into Upper Canada. It was because of Chloe Cooley. And what it did, this act, was to open up Upper Canada as a free space for a new enslaved people running away, or foreign people. So I should say people coming from the United States who were enslaved. They knew if they made it to Upper Canada, they would be free. They could f find freedom because Upper Canada was no free soil. The act, Steve, did not free one Upper Canadian slave. Remember, it it banned the importation of new mm -hmm. people. No, that's so, an important distinction. The enslaved people in Upper Canada still remained in their status as slaves, but it opened up the province as a free soil for foreign slaves and foreign women, in this case, the United States. That was the beginning of the Underground Railroad because enslaved African Americans knew, hey, if we made it to Upper Canada, make it to Upper Canada, we could be free. So here it was this woman, the body of this woman, 
I argue, upon which the Underground Railroad was built. So Chloe Cooley, I, I, I'm so pleased at the recognition that she's getting, because we know she screamed violently and made resistance when her enslaver tied her up with ropes, manhandled her, threw her in the boat, and rowed her across New York State, where slavery was still legal in New York State. And he sold her into that. So in, in a way, people think of enslaved people coming from America into Upper Canada. That's true, Underground Railroad. But before that era, Steve, enslaved Upper Canadians were oftentimes sold across the border into New York State and into Michigan. So Chloe Cooley embodies that kind of paradox for us, but she also embodies the resistance that enslaved people um, made to um, in, in gaining their freedom or attempting to gain their freedom. So the, the, the stamp, I think it's a beautiful learning opportunity for teachers and educators. So look at the stamp where you can teach your, your, your students. What does this mean? What's the meaning of this having this black woman on the stamp? So we made a plaque for her through the Ontario Heritage Trust. She has been the subject of a Heritage Minute by you know, Historical Canada. And um, other honors have been given um, to her. So I'm, I'm, the stamp is beautiful, as you said. It sure is. Afua, uh, just finally, if people want to know more about black history in Canada, what is one resource besides your very fine book that you would point people to? I can think of, Steve, um, the Canadian Encyclopedia. Uh, there are numerous wonderful learnings on that site, and it's online. People can just go there. Um, there's also, you know, Historica Canada. They have done a lot of great work, a lot of knowledge mobilization on Black history. It's online. Great for teachers, great for students and everyone in, in the public. Afu Cooper, we really want to thank you a great deal for coming on to TVO tonight and telling us all about your new book, The Underground Railroad, Next Stop, Toronto. Take good care and thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. You too. Bye-bye. And that is the agenda for Thursday, February 16th, 2023. Tomorrow, Nam Kiwanuka talks to Canadian futurist Sinead Bovell about artificial intelligence and what lies ahead for young people and technology. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. And Nam, we'll see you here tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Looking for more of TVO Today's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org slash newsletters to sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, read Steve Pakin's articles, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org slash newsletters.